So the text I read tells me about Jesus. Tells me about that Jesus is in the business of calling. Does it make sense? Because Jesus has a message of love, forgiveness, and hope. Anyone who is willing to listen to God's story will be inspired, convicted, and transformed. Right? That's what happens. Do you remember reading about a Pharisee? His name was Nicodemus. He came to Jesus. And then he was changed, right? Right? Yeah. And then do you remember about a Samaritan woman, you know, at the well? Jesus had some conversation with her. And then what happened? She was changed too. Transformed. She went home and witnessed to people. Yep. How about the blind man born blind? I mean, of course, the, he was born blind. <laughs> that, that guy was who was born blind. And Peter, how about Paul, right? Yeah, in Acts, he was transformed too. And in this transformation story, stories, you and I are part of it. You and I are part of the story this morning. Through history, we can say, gazillions of people have experienced the power of God. Their lives totally transformed. Because, because they gave God an opportunity. Right? Yeah. I can think about my Naga people. I can think about the millions of people in India, even though Christianity is still a minority among minorities. But still, India has a very vibrant Christian community despite and in spite of discrimination, rejections, and even persecution. None of those have stopped the growth of Christianity in India. You see? So, I have also, I have also met in churches I served, People with ardent, irreconcilable differences were disarmed and found ways to forgive and reconcile because they both made their commitment to Jesus. Does it make sense? I'm sure you know people like that. You know? And, and uh, for us in the United Methodist Church, last Sunday, I shared with you the membership covenant where we really say to one another, we will do everything in our power to reject evils in whatever forms they present. 
That is what faith does. That is what faith is about. That is what following Jesus is about, right? Am I making sense? That's what it is. So, um, following is what the first disciples did. When Jesus said, follow me, none of them said, wait. I've got some business to do. I need to go and talk to my parents. No. In fact, Mark's gospel says, immediate, the word immediate comes often. When they heard the call, follow me, they immediately left everything and followed. Following is what disciples do. You know, following is what sheep do. Right? They follow the good, trusted shepherd. That's what we are about. I believe until we learn to follow Jesus, we will continue to wrestle for peace. Restlessness um, Restlessness is what we all are used to. But I heard somebody say, and I agree, there is an emptiness at the center of our being. And that emptiness, the vacuum, cannot be filled by anything else that we know in this life. It is not going to be the house you have. It is not going to be the car you drive. It is not the business. It is not your world. That emptiness is where God sits. Does it make sense? God has to occupy that emptiness for us to find ourselves. Ah, very interesting. I believe that. Not that we as Christians are never going to be restless, but our restlessness will be tempered. Does it make sense? When God is marginalized in everything that we do, we become hopelessly, uh, what should I say, um, hopelessly torn between just and unjust. Our heart, our hearts look for something that will take the place of God. And that often doesn't work. Here are some sobering words from Matthew's Gospel. Chapter 6, verse, verses 30 to 33. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you? Take pride in you. 
do his best for you. What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax, Matthew says. To not be preoccupied with getting. So that you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over these things. And you know both God and how he works. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concern will be met. End of quote. That's what God is about. Give your attention, entire attention, to what God is doing right now and don't get worked up about what you may or what you may not happen or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Uh, God will help you. Following Jesus is to allow Jesus to speak and for us to listen. Does that make sense? When we go to God, we go not like this. I want to talk to you. We go to God like this, right? We go to God to listen. And if we listen, you and I will learn that we are called to be servants. Does it make sense? We are called to be God's servants. I found another text from Matthew's Gospel. Chapter 6. No, that's not true. <laughs> this comes from Matthew 20. Matthew 20. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be the first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what followership, that is what discipleship is all about, right? In the discipleship teaching, nowhere in the gospel you will find that God promises you a pedestal. I didn't hear it. I would like to see a pedestal right here. But that's not what it is. It is about servanthood. Right? That's what it is. That is what I read. So we are called to serve one another. Disciples are learner, learners. Right? That's what disciple is all about. We are called to learn. So, do you know that 
I'm quoting, do you know that the word discipline and disciple share the same root word? Ah, English teachers will know. Mm -hmm. The concept is that we surrender ourselves to something or someone similar to an athlete surrendering his will to a coach. In conflict, our surrender is to God and his wisdom. Proverbs is written for us to gain discipline for wise conflict management. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 3. Solomon said, we should love discipline. Proverbs 12, verse 1. And then this smart guy tells this. Race car drivers are among the most disciplined athletes in all sports. I didn't know that. The track of discipline has four turns. Teaching, training, testing, transforming. I go, that makes sense. You don't see, you know, race car drivers drinking Pepsi and driving, bur eating burgers. You know, they're focused. If you lose a focus a second, you're done. We are called to follow. Who is this person that we are supposed to follow? And John is very careful at making it sure that we know who it is. So these are some of the things that, jo that John said in chapter 1. Jesus is the Word, became flesh. Right? Ch John chapter 1, verse 1. And then he said, Jesus came as light to diffuse the darkness. Ah. John says, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, in verse 29. In verse 36, John says, look, the Lamb of God. In verse 40, we found the Messiah. Ah, we found the Messiah. In verse 45, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets. And then we hear Jesus, Joseph's son from Nazareth. And in verse 49, we hear Rabbi, you are God's son. You are the king of Israel. John just lays out all the credentials and commission God gave him. In other words, we are not just simply following an ordinary human being, but this, this Messiah is God's anointed. Think about that. And that is why we follow. That is why we are disciples. Yeah, that's what it is. There is another two word that stood out for me. One was the follow me. Other one is come and see. Come and see. Uh, one day Jesus was preaching around and disciples come and they go, where do you live? Which means, who are you? Kind of, you know. 
Well, Jesus didn't say, you know, about five miles down this way, on the right is Kentucky Fried Chicken, and then you, on, the, on your left is, you know, there is the uh, uh, McDonald's, and there's a gas station on your right. Uh, on your right, if you, if you are close to Costco, then you've gone too far. No, Jesus didn't say that. Jesus didn't even give them a GPS direction. Do you know what Jesus said? Come follow me. I mean, come, come and see. You come and check it out and you decide what you want to do. And disciples went and the text says they went and they stayed there. They remained there. Uh, when, when Philip was so excited about encountering Jesus, his heart was bubbling wanted to share this wonderful news with somebody. That's what happens, right? When the good news comes to you, you just don't go and hide in a closet, right? If you got a car, you call somebody. If you have a baby or a grandkid, you're calling. There is a cute story about Nicky Gumbel, who is the priest rector in Holy Cathedral uh, in London, and uh, they had their first child. So his wife made a note when the baby comes, call these people. So when the baby came, he called his mother-in-law. And th this was during before cell phone time. And then he was trying to dial his mother. And by the time he dialed, the mother picks up, congratulations, I got the news. And then he goes, how'd you know? Well, because your mother-in-law called me. And now two mothers are calling the others, and he's, he is still supposed to call all of them. And by the time he called all of them, everybody knew they had a baby. See how fast good news travels. And so, and so, and so in this, in this passage, Philip is really trying to, you know, to share something very positive that happened. And he calls Nathaniel. And Nathaniel goes, Nah. From thy side of the track, nothing good comes out. Uh, what can good come out of L.A.? Or south side of Chicago? Or think about what good can come out? Of Sun City United Methodist Church. Woo. And you just say, come and check it out. Right? If we are excited about something beautiful that is happening in our lives and in our ministry, here, even in Sun City United Methodist Church, what do you do? We tell people, Come and check it out. This Naga man on the pulpit is good. Or you say, there is something going on in our church. The M&M dinners are just wonderful. You got to come and enjoy it. And these butterfly groups, they care about one another. You know, I know you have lost somebody. You're going through some difficult time. I think coming to Butterfly Luncheon will really be a blessing for you. 
See, sometimes we just, we just don't tell people. We don't know what good is hidden in here. Does it make sense? Yeah. Churches that have learned to share are growing. Churches that have decided, oh, everybody knows, I don't have to call them, they'll come. Those are the churches that are struggling. I have served many churches. In so many churches I serve, there are some wonderful people, faithful people, but they all think that they are the gatekeeper. That their words are weightier than somebody, and they need to be asked, they need to be, they need a permission from this person. If the decisions are made, they will say, I was not consulted, and therefore I'm holding my offering. Huh? Yeah, there are churches who do that. Nobody spoke to me. I don't know. I was not consulted. I'm holding my offering. That means taking uh, the mission work hostage. That's not the way church functions. There are two denominations or religious communities that are growing. One is Jehovah Witnesses. You know why? Because they come to your door, and they knock. And if you let them in, they'll talk to you. And they invite you. Invite you. So they're growing. Another religious group that is growing are, are, are Mormons. See? <laughs> Mormon comes and knocks. And they talk to you. They are just so polite and nice. We often invite them and we talk. There were some young people who, 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 who used to repeatedly come because they want to talk to me. Because I make them think. They're growing. It's because... They personalize, and they invite you, welcome you to their community. And so, when Jesus said, come and see, when other disciples said, come and see, that's a good thing. I think all of us, those that are sitting here and those that are watching us online, we need to also practice this come and see model. Very friendly way of saying, come. I don't have to explain to you. I don't have to theologize anything to you. But just come, check it out. You like it, come. If you don't like it, fine. See? That's better, right? So that's what it is, sisters and brothers. Come and see. And God will do the rest. Amen.